All right, so welcome to our panel where we're going to talk about how to compete in big data. We have a pretty broad spectrum of panelists here. And let me do a quick round of introductions. Chris, to my right, is a man who sort of puts stuff together. So you like think of the guy who puts the pipes in your house, mm -hmm. connects the pipes. That's Chris, our plumber. <laughs> Vince is the one who like has a microscope to see what actually is flowing through your pipes. So he does the analysis. Don, you just heard about, is the one who actually makes the pipes. Bruce is the one without whom this wouldn't be happening. <laughs> He's the one who finances the pipes. And Greg, Greg is the one who makes stuff go through the pipes, into the pipes. So a little bit more detail, I go the other way around. Greg, tell me what your company does. Sure, um, what my company does is data and predictive analytics for the physical world. So basically we create a sensor pl platform that's able to gather uh, data in the physical world, let's say especially around urban areas, that helps retailers optimize their business. <coughs> So let me put this in plain English, and in full disclosure, I'm advisor <laughs> to the company. As you might walk through Palo Alto, you see in the stores those little Android thingies, cameras they're called, tape there with black tape. And some wire going up there somewhere. And they're reporting to headquarters, to him, what they're seeing, good face recognition. Every now and then a mobile bike gets sniffed, a MAC address might get sniffed. So you, with the data he creates, you actually know that you went to that store and so does the shop assistant. And not only do they know that you went to that store, they also know that you went to the competitor like five minutes ago. So that is eyes talks. Now, for a VC it's actually hard to come up with something specific. So I'll just give them some examples. West Point. Then, when I was still like in college, he ran the Unix division of Oracle. After that, he went to, where did he go afterwards? Apple. Okay. Apple. Lots of stuff at Apple. Newton, Newton years, I think. And then, after that, that <laughs> Siebel. <laughs> he was a co-founder of Siebel. And in that, of course, had an enormous exposure to uh, consumer data, to data, you know, CRM. Siebel was a CRM system which was bought by Oracle, right? Right. Um, so a perspective of a man of big data from like many more years ago that some of us actually are aware of. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Jose. Now, Don, summarize your talk in 30 seconds. Everything's going in memory. Build lots of applications. Play big data. You still have 20 left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Okay. Now to the analysis Social commerce, my of the plumbing. Social. To the analysis of what's flowing through there. We had some juicy stories backstage. But Vince asked me not to tell them. But he said he might be willing to tell them himself. <laughs> We do streaming big data analytics. We no, 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 the juicy story. The world gets <laughs> it. We, we do it for social media through uh, Listen Logic, and we do it on all types of data. And what we want to look at is the intent to understand what you are telling the world through public pronouncements about who you are, what you intend to do, uh, how we can serve you better advertising or better customer service, or interact with you and thank you for saying something nice. Now here's a question. Do you think that what people say in their carefully curated image of themselves on Facebook, Twitter, <laughs> you name it, and what they actually want has any resemblance? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because big data kind of takes care of that. First of all, with the volume that's flowing out of people, they are not monitoring everything they say 
and we know by the type of things they were saying, and the amount of people who are saying similar type of things. So a lot of the bias that is in survey, it goes away when people forget that they're participating or forget that the whole world is listening what they're publishing. And I don't know, very I'm very aware things. of the cost of interrupt and the sharing something with the world. When I tweet- Yes, but you're not our customer or most people's customer, you know a little more about it. Most people are not as guarded and most generations are very, very open. We see people talking about cancer and dying and family issues and their finances and uh, people live a very public life nowadays. And then finally we have Chris. And when we talked on the phone and he started getting, you know, talking about volatility or what is it, virality or virality, what did you call it about big data? You called it virility. Virility, <laughs> is that what you call it? <laughs> so think of him as the instantiation of virility of big data. Is that what you want me to say, right? No, no. that's <laughs> what you wanted to say, <laughs> but yeah. So, uh, first question. What is big data? Because before we know what we are competing in, let's actually figure out what is big data? Anybody from the audience wants to take a tack at that? I guess it's, it's something big that if you know how to use it or move it, you're gonna get big results from it. Hmm. Anything bigger that you can handle. <laughs> <laughs> Some people, s remember when, remember one meeting with Jeff Bezos when uh, we were coming up with the idea of the Kindle. And Jeff said, oh, that's great. That actually, you know, you can actually read it in one hand. And everybody else laughed about one-handed reading. And they said, why are you laughing? <laughs> so it's here, the same thing. So what's big data? For me, big data, as I said in my talk before, is a mindset. It is that you're not worrying about what you've got, but you assume that whatever you need is out there somewhere. And if it's not out there somewhere, at least you can get it. So that attitude that you are standing in the river where everything's flowing by, and rather than holding on to that one you know, poor fish, which you, know, you happen to catch at some stage called data set, you just wait for the fat one to come by. It's not about tool set, it's not about skill set, but for me, Big data is a mindset. Maybe big data is uh, noise. Size injects more noise than it does signal. And when you have everybody with a cell phone giving their little thoughts or brain bubbles that come out, you have a lot of noise. If you have the data coming out of our devices, the telemetry data, there's more than you can use. So that salmon may be in there, that big fish, but you may never see it. So at uh, BizBliss, I'll go to BizBliss, our social commerce company, we look at a lot of streams. We look at every single social graph that exists in the world. Okay, well that's a lot of data. Look at every single packet flow that comes at you, from every place in the world down to the MAC address, the IP address, every one of those pieces. Every transaction that's ever been done by you or anybody else like you in the world. We have that as our big data. So okay, every place so you, you are. You look you meaning as? BizBliss, our social commerce company, I talked about it earlier. And why do we look at all that data? Now right now we can't look at every piece of data simultaneously, but we'd like to. Because if we could look at every piece of data simultaneously, we'd never be able to commit fraud. There'd be no fraud. That's a huge problem. We'd know what you wanted before. Because we know everybody you wanted, right? And so when we look at the set of data that we want to encompass to make social commerce as fraud-free, as transaction possible, and as cheap as possible for you to do it, we look at every one of these streams of data. Right now, we can only take a subset of that data. We don't have every credit card transaction in history yet, but if we could, we'd debt it. We don't have every tweet in history yet, but if we could, we'd, we'd look at it. And if you look at those data sets, they're potentially manageable. They're only in the thousands of petabytes. Take the video out. If you could look at every single stream that happened, then you could make better decisions. And that's really you know, how we define the big data set we try to manipulate. So big data for you is what again? Every social graph that exists, every transaction you've ever done with the credit card, every packet stream flow from every location of every device, every mobile device. Okay. So big every data is all the data in the world. No, it's not all the data in the world. 
There's lots of data we don't have. All the data I talked about exists in an electronic database somewhere. There's tons of data in the world we don't have. Every piece of data I talked about exists somewhere. It's in Experian, it's in Axicom, it's in Facebook, it's in Google, it's in Twitter. So that's the data set, it, it's a known set, it exists. We can't get it all, but it exists. There's tons of data that's happening right now that no one's capturing. You captured ambient air temperature of this room, no you didn't, right? You captured your heartbeat, no. That's all the data in the world. You're not capturing. Uh, the data set we look at is data that exists and has been captured that we could potentially use. And every piece of data I gave you exists and has been captured. So big difference. My view about big data is that of a mindset because there are lots of sensors in this room which measure temperature. And if you want to get it, it's there. Yours is the existing data set, so it's okay. Now, wise man, Bruce. So I think if we want to talk about big data, we first want to start with data and what was that. So if you, th if you look at the 60s, 70s, and, and up until more recent times, data was really around transaction structure, transactional data. We dealt with at Oracle in the 80s and 90s, we dealt with issues around you know, hundreds of transactions per second. And we dealt primarily with structured data. I think when we talk about big data, we're talking about three dimensions. The first dimension is not just the, the, um, the structured data, but two other types, um, unstructured and semi-structured data. So that's one dimension that we need to deal with. The second is the velocity of the data. The velocity data is far faster, much more rapid, much more data happening in real time than ever before. And it's coming from a variety of different sources. And then it's the size, it's the volume of data that we need to deal with. And so I think that the computer science problems that we're having to um, solve today, which I think are dramatically different than what we had to solve 20 years ago, are dealing with those three dimensions. And they take place at different times and, and in different areas and manifest themselves in different types of computer science problems that we have to solve for, which is one of the reasons that you're seeing a broad, a broad set of different type of systems being developed. We look at Couch and Mongo and Hadoop and a variety of others. These are all being created to solve very specific classes of problems in a variety of different ways. And so I think if you take a look along those three dimensions, you can find yourself at a point, an access point uh, in space that kind of defines against the problem you have against the computer science that's available. And that's what big data and what companies who are addressing big data are trying to solve. There was an interesting article in the New York Times, maybe half a year ago, which made the point that big data research, and both in terms of the computer science, the algorithms, but more importantly in terms of the data sets, research has left the universities. It is now at the Facebooks and the Googles at the Amazons of the world. And I was wondering, you know, when the reporter talked to me, whether that is you know, one of the movements of academics who maybe didn't get a job at Google or Amazon or Facebook and now say, but they shouldn't be publishing papers without actually giving access to the data. Because of course, Facebook can't publish all its data. Besides, those very academics probably won't have the ability to actually have the equipment to actually crunch all those data. So has, when you refer to computer science and to research, has that left academia? Is that sitting at the big companies now? Or where do you get in those three dimensions you have? Where do you get the inspiration, I mean, you and your portfolio companies from? Well, I think there are people who would argue that, that it's left the universities. I think uh, places like uh, Caltech and MIT and Santa Barbara, which has a big uh, data science area, I think what's happening is there's becoming more of a partnership between commercial and, uh, and academia. I mean, Michael Stonebreaker is still a big uh, personality in data with his, um, some of his projects like VoltDB. Um, I think there is still a need to, to combine both the research aspects of, of data uh, along with the commerciality of it. Um, one of the things that isn't being brought up here you know, is that in order to be able to compete in big data, you have to have people understand it. And in order to understand it, you have to have deep um, expertise and, in, in the, the math and the science of this. So one of the things that I, I've seen as, as an investor, prior I was as an operating executive, is a dearth of people who have the technical acuity to really understand these issues. 
And so, and if you wait for this to manifest itself in the form of people who are graduating from universities, they'll get sucked into the existing companies like Facebook and, and Google, et cetera. So one of the things that I've done is kind of bypass that. We created a, a new program inside of Caltech where we're sponsoring um, different students with an academic scholarship, an internship, you know, and giving them the ability to work inside our portfolio companies for summers prior to, to graduation. So there's people who have data science as a skill set who can come into these companies that are looking actively seeking people with those skill sets and bridge those two things together. So I don't think that, I don't think there's been a separation. I think that there's actually more of a partnership probably than ever before. What actually is a data scientist is a question I often get asked. Any opinions here? You went to Caltech? Yeah, well, I... So I you went to Caltech actually before the web existed. <laughs> Hard to believe, but... Um, I, I, I think about big data um, kind of similarly. I think th th there's a view of, of the way that Bruce described it. I think the other way of thinking about big data is gain the data. And, there's, and these days, big data is really big because there's so many autonomous ways of gaining this data from people sharing it to sensors in the environment. Um, but I think it's also the processing and cleaning of the data. And I think that's kind of where the data scientists really come in. So st statistics have become really hot because there's so much data out there. And how do you really make sense of it? And I, I, I agree that with Bruce that um, the skill set of analyzing data is actually very tough because we, we also have our own challenges. But I, I think to me one of the biggest part, and this is kind of like the, to me the third step of big data, is really generating actionable insights. And I, I think to really develop actionable insights, you have to understand the problem very well. So I think there's also, um, I think that there's, I think the data science is hard, but I also think understanding the application is just as hard because I think Andreas talked about earlier t this afternoon, understanding the problem very well is very important. But if you don't understand the problem, then it's kind of like the Cheshire cat, like which way do you want to go? Anyway is good, if you unless you know which way you want to go. Which reminds me of a story just for entertainment here. Albert Einstein, physicist, Princeton. He was taking the train, the train from Princeton, and the conductor came by. And you know how it is in America. Click, 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 you know. And Albert looked in his pockets. Hair or ruffled. <coughs> Didn't find the train conductors. Don't worry about it. You know, don't worry about it. Okay, Professor Einstein. At the end of the compartment, the conductor turns around and sees Albert under his desk, under his table, under his whatever it is in his trains, in a coach, you know, what do you call it, chair or whatever. Desperate look, he said, Professor Einstein, don't worry. We know who you are. And he said, I know who I am, but I don't know where I'm going. So where is data science going? Is that feedback loop tight, that feedback loop of looking at data, getting ideas, that feedback loop of education, that feedback loop of companies? So there's a number of areas that is interesting in data science. The data scientist is more interdisciplinary than ever before. You know, we often start with the answers, with the MBAs. What do we want to know of the data versus the pure math? and you bring in linguistics, and you have to understand how to deal with a lot of unstructured data and how you mash up data. It, the complexity grows, the answer is more difficult. There are also social angles to this, um, in terms of what is the question. There, there are lots of uh, things that come out when you're actually looking at the data, buying patterns and, and a lot of other social behavioral things that that are probably not app apparent to a scientist if he was to look at it just from that perspective. But a data scientist is probably expected to come up with uh, these type of uh, pictures of the data he's looking at. One of the companies, Founders Fund, who I'm an LP, invested in is called Palantir. Palantir is basically a pretty good, I think, data analysis company. And the main thing about Palantir is that it just reduces the cycle time dramatically. It's just tools which allow people to form hypotheses, play with them, to try them out, to have a dialogue with the data, which in the olden days of somebody ships a data set to an, I think they were called analysts, right? They do the analysis and they, they'll get back to you. It's just the big difference is that cycle time of analysis, that getting the questions scientific, you know, formulating hypotheses and then trying them out. So one thing when we prepared for this panel, even it doesn't seem like that we did, 
uh, there were three kinds of economics we want to discuss. There was the economics of sensing, the economics of communication, and the economics of data. So what we meant by economics of sensing is that we can have people-centric data creation, like the mobile phones we carry, super rich sensors, for instance, for geolocation. Or we could have place-centric data collection, like what Greg has. And I want to put the other two out and then leave it up to people to discuss which they want to discuss. We have the economics of communication. And if you think back, why do firms exist? People got Nobel Prizes for answering questions like this or for maybe asking a question like this. And it was because the communication within a firm was much cheaper than the communication between firms. Well, that is totally gone. So many people actually, and it's interesting how to see this paradigm shift in students. I'm from a generation where you know wikis were the thing to go. One single point of truth. It's very difficult to get students to actually contribute to a class wiki. They are just much more, hey, we comment. It's the flow. Oh, let me LOL, OMG, and so on. Let me just comment on other people. It's very difficult, very different at least from what it was for. For the com economics of communication has huge effects, I think, about the workplace, the workplace, the future of work, how will people work together. So that's the second point of a big data. And the third one is the economics of data, namely the monetization. How do we make data about, how are we doing money, actually, about my data? What does it mean to own data? So economics is something which we're interested in. Who wants to take attack um, economics of data. Wise man Bruce? <laughs> <laughs> the, the economics of data. I, th I think that um, accessing data is relatively cheap. I mean, I think that we've got, um, obviously, all the, the, social, the social data that's being generated. Um, in fact, I, I would say that access to, to data is probably the cheapest that it's ever been. I mean, you used to pay um, we still pay companies like IRI and, and AC Nielsen and IMS or whatever a lot of money for data. But rapidly, um, that is uh, there are companies that are searching for ways to go around those more traditional um, those more traditional models and try to find as as I think was suggested before the the signal out of the noise out of a lot less expensive data. So the economics of data I think are going to come in the form of being able to apply machine learning and pattern matching to the data that, and being able to extract the signal from, from noise and being able to provide a much cleaner signal to companies to take action against. I'll give you a good example of this. Procter & Gamble. Um, about six, seven years ago, Walmart removed point of sale data from, uh, from, the, uh, from basically the public market. That is, they used to resell their POS data to companies like Procter & Gamble to understand what was happening in the retail market. And and Procter & Gamble paid a lot of money for that, and a lot of other people paid a lot of money for that kind of data in order to be able to understand and predict what products they want to be able to build and deliver. Walmart turned that off, and that basically blinded Procter & Gamble. And from, from the CEO on down, they then initiated a program called World Without Retailers. And the basic gist of this was to be able to discover a mechanism that, or mechanisms that they could determine without using POS data what was really going to happen in the market space. And the only thing that started to be able to make that a reality from where it was in the past was the ability to be able to take Twitter data, to be able to take blogs, et cetera, and to be able to process that information rapidly and come up with answers. That introduced a whole set of other issues, like how do you deal with the ontologies of these systems, which are very expensive to create? How do you deal with the, the fact that there is a lot of false positives? Um, how do you deal with language issues? You know, so if you use NLP processing against this data, you deal with the, the context of, of language where bad doesn't always mean bad. I think it's a pretty overused example. But that's a very realistic example. How can you apply Bayesian technology or Bayesian techniques against these, this unstructured data and come up with answers? So I think that the data, the cost of, of accessing the data, is, I think it's, is order of magnitude less but the challenge then is to clean, to process the data, to generate the signal. And you have to use information technology to, to solve for that problem. And I think that's what people here on this panel and others are attempting to do. 
So what about the cost of consuming the data? The cost of attention, the cost of, you know, you know, Greg said actionable insights. I mean, I think that is the main cost which is remaining. That's the key to the cost. When you look at the data as large as it is, we can now, with systems like violin, store it inexpensively, relatively inexpensively. But the complexity of getting the information out of that data, the cleaning of the data, getting the deeper insights, adds tremendous complexity that takes much more uh, processing units than does looking at the data with simplistic answers. This is compounded by the speed at which you want the answers. If we can put them in a database and wait for a day or two, that's much less costly into trying to understand it in memory stream. So the cost factor is also compounded by the size at the speed at the complexity, and now we're talking in billions of whatever we're talking about. And those billions of uh, transactions have to be at pennies and not dollars where we are today. Now, unfortunately, we only look at our names, which by now actually we have learned. Is there anything from the Twitter stream which I should pick up from an audience question here? You guys see that all the time. We don't see it. Is there anything you feel I should know about? Do you have any question? Yes, quick question. How do you see, how do you do privacy factoring into the cost of this data for data analysis? So the question is, how do we view privacy factoring into uh, the competition in big data, into uh, the costs? So, so the price of privacy, but from the different constituencies, the price for the individual who decides not to share his geolocation and thus has much harder time to get relevant search results, the cost of that company, which has, as it has happened to many companies, there records sort of uh, disappear or are being duplicated somewhere? I would say in the absence of regulation, uh, you really have no privacy left. Um, as you point out, if you want to use a map, you sign it away. If you want to transact on a website, you sign it away. So for the most part, in the absence of regulation, like in healthcare, where some of your records are kept private in the U.S., uh, and of course Europe, I'm talking about the U.S., Europe has uh, stricter privacy laws, you really have no privacy. You, the credit card companies have your data, uh, Google and the rest of them have your location data. Uh, the telcos have all your data, where you've been. So, so if they choose to, as Walmart used to, I guess, and has stopped, sell it. They uh, do again, but they, they, do they, they again. stop. Yeah. Yeah, they, and, and so really you have very, very little privacy unless you take an offensive view to create, uh, put noise uh, into the signal. So why is that a good thing? Do we not have privacy? Why is that a bad thing? could be a good thing because it creates trust. If my friend knows that I'm here as opposed to, you know, doing funny things somewhere, you know, that creates trust by giving up that privacy. So it's good and bad and it's required. You know, social is about open. And the only reason it goes viral is that it's all shared. And the only reason it's free is because that information can be used. Uh, I was one of the founding board members of the International Association of Privacy Professionals. From a legal point of view, which is different from a press and a perception point of view, it's quite clear if you publish information, even in the EU data directive, all right, that is exempt from onward transfer, from notice, from choice, because you've published it quite publicly. But perception is very different than that. We must remain sensitive to it and how it's perceived and how it's used. But mostly people understand that they are talking publicly. They forget from time to time but they are posting pictures publicly to be shared. I think it's societal norms which are shifting. And the fact that if you are reposting my Craigslist ad, and then, you know, whose problem is that? And I think the norms are shifting that it might have been my problem about the juicy stuff I post in Craigslist. It is now his problem that he decides to publish this. At the uh, video interview, I just gave as an example a friend of mine who actually, when people hit him up on Grindr and he doesn't like it, he just takes a screenshot and puts it on his Facebook. That is an interesting ecosystem change. Or the former um, chief scientist of British Telecom, he open sourced all of his email within BT. And he said it had an amazing effect 
of people not bickering about each other anymore. In the remaining time, and I prompted all of you for that, the last question is, make a prediction for 2020. Greg. Yeah, I, I think that the winners in 2020, when we look back on them, are going to be people that are able to um, take the actionable insight gained from all this big data analysis and actually able to integrate into the business process. I think there is a lot of hard technical things, but I think a lot of that will be solved by, by various folks and by various types of plumbing. But I think really, um, really being able to integrate into the business process, maybe for instance helping a retailer boost their margins by 6%, um, that's, that's really where the value is going to be delivered, is actually um, uh, delivering value. Chris, Bruce. I think products like Waze and others that do similar things are going to be integrated into our lives. It'll be inside your car. It'll, you'll get rerouted. Um, we, don't, we can't build more infrastructure, so we have to find ways to use it more effectively. I think those types of products, which is why I think Waze is going to be very, very valuable. Um, I wish I was an investor in that. The, um, but I, I believe that type of technology will be rolled out by 2020 for all of us to use. Don. 2020 is an eternity, so I'll go with two things I think are interesting. One is a continuous health monitor. You'll be completely wired and monitored uh, uh, on your health, um, blood levels, chemicals, and 3D printing will be widespread. Vince. 2020, what we see is big now. We'll look back and say it was very small. And uh, the new norms will be a very, very deep understanding in very, very short time at very, very low cost. And Chris? So being the geek that I am, I, I, I think um, data, like the Star Trek data, would be life. Although not a hologram, but there would be something that you could ask and, and get any information. On that note, I thank you very much for volunteering to be on this panel, and I thank you for, for your staying. Time. Thank you. <laughs>